Welcome everybody to the Tree Fund webinar series. I'll just give everybody a couple minutes to join in. I think we had a little over 1,300 people uh, registered. Thank you very much for your continued support on the Tree Fund webinar series as we continue our series into 2024. Um, for those that know the history, we started this webinar series in 2017. So it's been going for a number of years now, and I'm excited to see the continued support that we have from the arboriculture and urban forestry communities out there. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started since we are about a minute past and we have a fantastic speaker with us today with a wonderful topic. Um, as you all know, my name is Bo Broadbeck. I work with Auburn University Extension. We are always honored to partner with Tree Fund and host the Tree Fund webinar series. As you all know, this is our opportunity to share the emerging research that is funded by Tree Fund through generous donations from the arboriculture and urban forestry communities to advance science in the fields of arboriculture and allow us to share some of those uh, research results with you very often for the first time as we go through our, our recent uh, grant recipients. Um, with me today, I have uh, Heath Hupke with Tree Fund, as well as Dr. Paul Putman, who will be providing a Tree Fund update. Uh, I just wanted to provide a quick introduction uh, for Dr. Paul Putman as he um, is still relatively new at Tree Fund. We brought him on to Tree Fund in July of 2023, so about halfway through last year. Uh, and we recruited Dr. Putman from the Cleveland Foundation, which was the world's largest community foundation where he served as both grant making and philanthropic uh, departments for 15 years. Um, Dr. Putman earned his doctorate in urban education from CSU with a focus on leadership and lifelong learning. Dr. Putman, thank you very much for joining us on Tree Fund and providing the Tree Fund update. I will turn the virtual floor over to you. Great. Thanks both so much. And thank you again for hosting, um, for Alabama Extension hosting the webinar series. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Tree Fund. And a big thank you to our Crown and Platinum partners that you're seeing on this first slide. I'm really thrilled to see such a diverse group of arborists, researchers, and tree care business owners joining us from around the world. As a reminder, at the Tree Fund, we're committed to advancing research, education, and awareness surrounding the importance of trees. We could have next slide, please, for whoever's advancing. One more slide, please. For those of you um, who might be familiar, many of you are with our Tour to Trees event. It's now in our 34th year. This year, we're heading to New England for a five-day, 425-mile ride, kicking off at Bartlett Arboretum in Connecticut to celebrate the birthplace of the International Society of Arboriculture on its 100th anniversary. Riders will enjoy beautiful New England scenery, including a lap around Martha's Vineyard Island. Along the way, we will plant trees, engage and educate local communities in the importance of trees and tree care, and have a lot of fun. Next slide. As Part of our ongoing commitment to promoting tree conservation and environmental stewardship, we want to extend a special invitation to all of our webinar attendees today to participate in the virtual Tour to Trees. While we'd love for all of you to join us for the in-person event, we recognize that it's not logistically feasible for everyone. It is for this reason that we've introduced the virtual Tour to Trees at Home Challenge. Next slide, please. On your screen, you will see a QR code um, and a link will be posted in the chat that will take you to more information about the tour or the virtual tour. Registration for the virtual tour is only $50 and you have all summer until August 30th to bike, walk, run, or swim the 425 miles. There's some great rewards to top fundraisers, but ultimately everything raised during this event goes to support research and educational programming such as today's webinar. The Virtual Tour to Trees offers a unique opportunity to combine your passion for physical activity with a worthy cause. Whether you're an avid cyclist or a casual rider, a marathon runner, or a dog walker, you can make a difference by joining the Virtual Challenge to support critical research initiatives that benefit our urban forests. Next slide. We have a goal of 100 Virtual Tour to Trees participants this year. If Tree Fund webinars have been meaningful to you, maybe helping improve your practice, better serve your clients, 
keeping you and your team safer, we hope that you'll join us for the tour this year, either in New England with dozens of other cyclists and tree nerds, or virtually on your own or with friends, family, or coworkers. Next slide. Now, if the Tour to Trees just isn't for you, we understand you can still support the work of Tree Fund through this QR code or by clicking on the link in the chat. Thank you so much for your consideration and support. I'm now pleased to introduce our Grants and Development Manager, Heath Hupke, who will introduce our speaker. Heath. Thank you, Paul. And, th and thank you, everybody, for, for attending today. And I, I know a large reason is to continue your, your education um, through, through CEUs. And we, um, Tree Fund, it's a little different. Tree Fund will be submitting uh, on your behalf um, at the end. If you attend uh, the entire session, we will be able to um, send ISA your certification number when you register and, uh, and your name. Um, I know in our last webinar, we did have some issues. So if you haven't received uh, past CEUs, please feel free to, to contact that email at the bottom, education at treefund.org. Um, and, and we also ask, please do not uh, input your, your uh, CEU information into chat. It will not be recorded. Um, if you have any questions on your CEU information, again, email it to the, the email at the very bottom, education at treefund.org. Um, we're very excited to, to be able to offer these opportunities for free for you, hopefully during a, a convenient time and a, and a convenient way. It's, it's our um, honor and privilege to be able to fund this research, um, but then don't let it, not let it stop there, but to continue that, that education um, through, through our webinar series. And uh, we're very excited to be able to host Matt, um, Matt Follett, uh, and and his uh, his title advances in our understanding of dynamic forces applied to tree during removal operations, uh, results in techniques to mitigate the risk of failure. Um, Matt's experience as a as a participating arborist, and he is currently pursuing a PhD in tree biomechanics. Matt has a strong interest in the technical aspects of preserving large trees in the urban setting. His long climbing career has also influenced his dedication to climber safety and a research interest in the loads associated with both climbing practices and technical removal operations. You know, we're excited for him to share his research, which was supported by, uh, by Tree Fund's um, Safe Arborist Techniques Fund grant. Um, and uh, the study specifically examined the distribution of forces through the, the tree during dismantling options and questions of biomechanical models developed on wind and gravitational inputs into tree count crown architecture would map to removal uh, operations. The results have direct implications for working arborists, many of you, and to help mit uh, develop mitigation measures to reduce loading, um, stress, and strain in the, in the stem. Uh, we. This promises to be an insightful and, and enriching session, uh, and we're excited to have you all here and a part of it. So uh, once again, if, if you want to in the chat, welcome Matt, thank him for coming, and I will uh, stop sharing my screen and, and let Matt um, take over here. Hi everyone, uh, welcome, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's, it's great to kind of get the results out from what we're working on. Um, to uh, to the people that it matters to. So uh, yeah, uh, without too much to do here, I'm gonna try and share my screen. Make sure that that works. And that looks good. good. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Excellent. Okay, yeah, um, I love long titles for some reason. Um, we've already heard it, but uh, this is, this is a, a, a suite of projects um, that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, my main line of research is really supposed to be uh, trees and wind and pruning for my PhD thesis work, um, but side projects are fun. And um, an opportunity came up in 2019 to apply for the Safe Arborist Technique Fund. So this is SATF 19-604R. Um, that was one component of what we're going to talk about today, but it was kind of the seed that got this whole line of research going. And um, I'm super excited to present it, and it is continuing to, to roll. 
Uh, some of these are still work in progress. Some of them are so close to done, they should have been published already. Some of them are published in, in uh, Arborist News and TCIA magazines. Um, we're still working on final results for, for journal publication. But anyway, that's it. Um, so, uh, there we go. Um, I'm a climber. Um, I'm a climber with sort of a varied background, mostly in the private industry. Um, lots of technical rigging in my background, lots of fine pruning, um, but always with a tone to practical science. Uh, I've been interested in the science side of things since my early days in school at Niagara Parks Commission School of Horticulture. Um, and recently in the last sort of 10 years, I've been dedicated mostly to the academic world, although I'm still trying to climb at least once a week. Um, I am part of a suite of um, researchers. My PhD supervisor is Christian Messier at UCAM and UCO, uh, and he holds a chair, uh, a research chair, um, that is an industrial chair in part funded by Hydro-Quebec. Uh, we have a suite of um, things that we're looking at for the urban forest uh, with some mind towards maintaining around the utility uh, network. Um, it's in French because we're in Montreal. Uh, we're looking at biomechanics. That's mostly me. Uh, we're looking at the control of crown growth with uh, around the wires, um, a whole suite of projects happening there. We're using terrestrial LIDAR to look at both um, biomass increase, but also some really cool stuff with possible risk um, prediction, um, soil network, uh, effective climate change, and developing some big um, software tools for urban forestry. Um, one little, I, I won't go through them all from the chair, but uh, one kind of fun one I think is kind of neat. Um, we're, we're sort of borrowing a page from Espalier and we're working to try and um, reduce the amount of pruning required around the around the, the low tension utility network, you know, sort of single or maybe three phase distribution uh, network um, by basically doing some structural training early on in the tree's growth to avoid the amount of pruning. Um, so that project's just getting up and going. Um, as I mentioned, we have, uh, we've partnered with a bunch of, um, well, with Jakarto, a, a LIDAR, mobile LIDAR company. We have a bunch of uh, data from before and after an ice uh, storm that recently hit um, um, Montreal and our own LIDAR data in that, um, in that nursery where we have the, the structures. So lots of fun stuff going on. Um, so back to the, uh, the case in point. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about three uh, projects, um, blocks and rigging rings. Uh, that was the initial funding from the tree fund project. Uh, that moved into looking at some damping because we had developed this way to monitor stem stress, strain, motion, um, in a rigging scenario, we decided, hey, let's take it to some actual biomechanics work. And then finally, um, a recent project that's really still in, in the heavy into the analysis, um, but a, a neat project that we're hoping to do more work on uh, that's looking at single stem removals out on the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so chapter one. Uh, as I like, said, I like my titles, Blocks or Rigging Rings, an investigation into the efficacy of introducing friction at the rigging point. Um, so we know that traditional rigging blocks um, at the upper anchor point have uh, caused a multiplication effect. I put 100 pounds, kilograms, boots, um, stones, whatever on one side, I have to match that with the other side so we get a multiplication times two at the top. Um, rigging rings and thimbles have become popular with the belief that the induced friction mitigates that. But Brian Kane put out a, a paper in 2019 saying, hey, wait a second, there's some problems with this. A really good paper looking at a snubbed off scenario. So basically he looked at what happens when we're using a rigging ring and we drop a piece in and it gets locked up. And in that case, um, actually has the potential to increase the amount of load that the stem sees because there's not the elasticity um, in the lower leg of line allowed because of the friction. 
But I was like, hey, I know, yeah, but it's in a running rope scenario. So does it work when everything goes right? Um, so that was the impetus of this. Um, so we have uh, some friends of mine and co-workers uh, working on the project. Uh, it's funded by the Tree Fund, um, some money from the, my supervisor's project, the city of Dorval here in, in Montreal, and uh, a local tree company helped out immensely. Uh, this is the project design, initial project design. We're going to drop a piece of wood and we're going to measure some things. We're going to measure stem stress. So how much the stem is bending by measuring the elongation uh, in these marginal fibers here with a, a some sort of linear device. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, we're going to throw some accelerometers in there to measure motion. Um, and it's a rigged scenario, and we want it to be a repeated test. So we had to come up with some sort of rising rate incline plane device to bring it to a stop rather than uh, somebody holding a rope where there's the potential for, for variation between, between scenarios. Um, and for fun, we're going to stick some lasers on the side of the tree and project them at a screen and see if we get not just point data down here, but essentially uh, cheap calculus uh, by capturing motion in several spots uh, fairly inexpensively. Um, the first thing was to try and come up with this robot groundy automated system. Originally, I thought just an inclined plane and a couple of you know late evenings drinking uh, Quebec beer in the shop showed that an inclined plane wasn't going to work. And the piece that I had modeled would just go all the way to the bottom as the inclined plane sled rolled up. So we went to a parabola. Um, and this is what we ended up with uh, in a test scenario. This is not July in Montreal. This was uh, ahead of time. Just this is the system. It's first iteration. So this sled rolls along, climbs the track, uh, and brings the piece to a stop. And it worked really well. Uh, we were super happy with, with this. It's really repetitive. We can tune um, the sled by adding mass to it. And once we get it set for the scenario, it just everything stays the same and we repeatedly drop the piece. Um, we needed to measure this elongation of the marginal fibers. And if you're at all familiar with any biomechanics motion tracking, there's various ways to to measure motion within the tree. One sort of well-recognized way is to measure the, this elongation of marginal fibers. Uh, it has to be, you know, sort of to less than 0 0.001 of a millimeter. Um, most of the commercial units which we had thought about using are used in slow tests where we're looking at either static tree pulling tests um, or wind. And this is a uh, impact, things had to happen fast, so I had to make my own. Um, and the, the, the basic is pretty pop, uh, basic principle is pretty simple, uh, a couple of tests, and we ended up with this as our final device, basically a linear potentiometer, uh, a piece of steel and a strain gauge strapped to, uh, glued to it. Uh, and when this shaft moves back and forth, uh, we're sensitive to 0 0.001, actually probably better, but I have not calibrated it beyond that. But anyway, the results of the device are pretty good. Uh, these are the lasers. Uh, this is a little test. Basically, each laser is going to project to the screen. Um, we're going to pull on the tree here and let it go. Watch the lasers dance. It's my, uh, at the time, eight-year-old daughter helping out. So we're pulling the tree. It's 100 kilograms of load on a um, 40 centimeter poplar with a rope at about uh, 15 meters up and me just pulling on it with a, with a three to one. Um, so pretty effective way of measuring motion as well. Um, this is our project site. Um, we have a live but declining ash, 45 centimeters at the base, seven and a half meters to the, um, the notch. The initial piece weighed 260 kilograms. That's what you see there. We cut that down a little bit because it was just a bit unwieldy um, to move around to 200 kilograms. And in part, because the little crane we had just didn't quite get high enough. But anyway, so we, we worked with this 200 kilogram piece. Um, these are the, 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 
devices we're testing. We've got a safe block, three-way safe block, uh, a number um, two size ring, uh, double ring, a number three single ring, and this was our control, um, just a standard Arbus block, uh, the DMM impact block. Um, I used stable braid um, because I like it. <laughs> and it didn't matter, we're using the same rope all the same time. Um, to control the uh, direction of fall, we cut a notch, uh, a kerf, where the um, the hinge would be. Uh, we did that on, on the piece that was falling, uh, and we did that on the standing stem. And every time we would insert a piece of plywood to align it, and that acted like the hinge to control the direction of fall. Uh, and it looks something like this, and slow-mo is always... So the piece would come off, the plywood wouldn't break, but it would direct it, and then it would slide out. We'd use a new piece of plywood every time. Piece comes down, gets caught in the rigging, and the sled rises the parabola and brings it to a stop every time just above the port wrap. And we would measure on every instance the, the final height, um, the distance between the anchor and a cut bunch of stuff. So everything was really, really well controlled. Uh, we're doing this in a park, um, which was uh, an opportunity for passersby to make comments about how long it was taking to take the tree down. Um, but uh, also the fact that what, what we just uh, putting that tree back together, I guess you could say. We also got comments from uh, local tree companies that were driving by that thought that the robot roundy sled thing was probably not going to be profitable and they weren't interested in buying it. But uh, I, I'm not sure. Maybe a few people said they would. Anyway, um, these are some results. Um, so what we have at uh, the top here, this is the strain from a single gauge that, uh, in the direction of the fall. Um, and this is the Porter wrap load. So we here see the strain is, uh, you know, sort of we're getting about 0.1 millimeter of elongation of the fiber. And that's matched in time with a... 675 some odd kilogram load of uh, uh, in the line. And I use kilograms of force just because I think that maps on rather than using kilonewtons. So everybody kind of knows what a kilogram is. If you're used to pounds, just uh, multiply it by two and that's how many pounds you're going to approximately. <laughs> okay. Um, we are only going to focus on this initial strain hump for um, all of the research or all the results here. The reason being is that if the piece came back and smacked the stem, which it did in several cases, um, we would get this really big spike in the stem sway, <clears throat> larger than than we would have expected. And that's because of the energy that was inputted from the piece into the stem in this lateral motion and we see it in the data from our accelerometer so here we have the piece falling getting captured in the in the um, rope with a, a, a force of about 6g um, which maps on with this and i think my charts are quite lined up perfectly here but this spike here at 13 g's is in another axis it's going sideways and and so this is the moment that the piece smacked the stem and then we would see this big resultant um vibration afterwards in the stem so for everything that we're going to talk about here in this project we're just looking at this initial spike um so if we look at the arborist block number one this is just a, a little sample we see a peak of 0 0.0019 and here we have 0 0.009 and so the ring has a slightly lower um, peak force. Um, the cool thing from the from the lasers is that it mapped on really nicely. Really fast. When we slow it down, that's just the stem moving around. Moves back a little bit, the piece falls and gets, no, oh, no, not yet. There you go, piece gets captured in the rigging. Piece ruins. Then the piece hits the stem, hits the stem, the lasers go everywhere and the, the, the good anymore, but we, we get that initial um, 
change. Uh, this mapped really well. So uh, we, we track the lasers with uh, tracking software. Um, and uh, this is upside down. So the top laser is here at the bottom of the graph. I work in R. Uh, and then for those of you who have done a program in R occasionally, it makes you, drives you mad. Um, so the, the, the lower laser is here. The upper laser is here. And the spikes are getting lower and lower as we go down. But anyway, it worked really well. We, we were super happy. Okay, to clarify the next couple of slides um, for the results, we have yellow is our hoarder wrap load. So we're looking at the, the force that we see at the, at the base of the tree in the, uh, in the load cell there. The green is derived from the acceleration data here. The red is taking the green and the yellow and putting them together. Um, so that we, we get a proxy for the anchor load. I had thought about installing some sort of load cell here, but we wanted a real world scenario and the addition of a load cell was going to add a lot to the drop distance, um, the distance of fall. And so I wanted to be able to use the ring up tight because that's the way that's one of the advantages of them. Um, so we, we neglected that and we get it by proxy. So we, we take these two and we basically add them together. So if we look at the Porter wrap load results, um, this was absolutely not surprising. For those of you that have used uh, rings, you know that typically you take a wrap off at least uh, if you're for the similar load. So our sort of average load for the for the 200 kilogram, 400 pound piece um, falling out of the tree and getting captured uh, in the rigging rope itself down at the base was around 700 kilograms, 1400 pounds. We saw a drop to about half of that for all of the ring devices. So they were only seeing about 300 kilograms, 600 pounds down there. At the anchor point, when we take the two of them together, we get a reduction of about one third. So here's the hit home point, the good old 10 times rule. Even in a running rope scenario, our 200 kilogram piece was hitting the upper rigging somewhere around 1,800 kilograms. So that's a fair amount of load. We're getting close to working load limits, depending on the ropes that you're using up there on a 200 kilogram piece in a running rope scenario. Uh, what we saw was a reduction of about one third uh, in that load with the rings. Again, losing we assume losing that energy in friction uh, in heat as friction. When we look at the strain data, it maps on wonderfully, okay? So one third here, this is the proxy. We go here, we get a one third reduction in stem stress on the, uh, um, on the stem, um, which I think is, is, is that's you know, sig significant scientifically and significant for us. Uh, these things do work in a running rope scenario when they're supposed to work. Again, go back to Brian's paper, they don't work if things get snubbed off. But if, if, if the, everything works, they work, okay? This, I think, is the bigger take home from the whole project. Um, yeah, rings work, great. What they don't do is change what the lead rope sees in force, or at least not much. The stem gets a reduction in strain. The upper anchor point reduction in strain, but Nothing really changes here. The only way we could change the amount of strain that this sees, because mass is mass, energy is energy, the same mass has to fall and be captured on the same point, is to slow down the length of time that it's decelerated. And so because it's happening at about the same speed, maybe happening just a little bit slower in time with the rings, there's no real significant change between the safe block, for example, and the rope, uh, or sorry, the standard um, arborist block in this leg of line. And why is that important? It's important because we as a climber don't feel the change there. We're standing up here and we're like, yeah, this is way better. I love rings, they're so smooth. But the rope down here is going, no, rings don't help at all. And this is where we see a lot of failures is because there's constant attachment point at this point. We've got um, 
cycles to failure, the piece is getting tied on there time and time again. This section of rope is getting fatigued. Feels better for us, the potential to lose a piece, um, possibly prematurely or when you didn't expect it for what the rigging feels like in the tree. Uh, we're not riding this down. We don't see any, and we don't notice the difference. So that's, that's my biggest takeaway uh, from this project. Um, yeah, well, the conclusion thing, I think I've covered that all. Um, the, the, the rigging rings reduce stress, um, but the best way to manage load on the lead line is still the mass times distance equation. How big the piece is uh, and how far it has to fall. And in the next one, we're gonna cover that uh, again for, and you know, it's kind of been out there in the, in the popular arborist rigging literature for a long time, but sometimes it's good to come back to these things. So we'll talk about more this mass times distance equation in the next one. Just because it feels safer for the climber doesn't mean we've eliminated energy in the system. Energy's energy. It's still there. It still has to be dissipated somewhere and the same amount of, of energy is going into the, into that line. So that's that one. Okay. Uh, chapter two. So again, I mentioned that, you know, I'm supposed to be studying effects of pruning on tree motion, particularly in wind. Um, and, uh, this was kind of like, well, hey, I have, we have this going on in the background. Let's see if we can merge the two together. So we, we've, we've got our similar sort of scenario, rigging scenario as the past one, but this time we're gonna look at the effect of leaving limbs on the stem as we throw tops. Basically, we're trying to avoid this scenario. Um, just the sort of, big pushback and then big swing and getting thrown off of, off of the spikes. I, I use this video, it's older, um, but it really, I think, helps to illustrate the point. Uh, this is circa 2005, six, something like that. And the rope operator on the ground, my boss, uh, locked it up uh, fairly tight. And what I want you to pay attention, this is in slow motion, is the motion and what happens to these stems back here. The piece gets caught, and then we see all this energy transfer into these stems up here. And I am quite certain, this is a big, tall poplar, you know, zoomed in, terrible 2005 uh, video. Um, I'm sure I would have been chucked up right off my spikes and not smiling like I am now if I didn't have these two branches below me uh, in that scenario. And that's not really a huge talk. Okay. So where does this come from? Um, this is the whole idea of damping. And you know, if you if you spend any time uh, reading up or, or working in the biomechanics world, you, this would be old hat, but the idea that each individual limb provides some sort of damping effect uh, for the tree. Um, these are the results from a project by Spatz uh, back in, in 2007. This is a, a small Douglas fir where they pulled it with a rope and let it go and let it swing back and forth. And this is what we call the decay time. And this is, you know, the, the frequency um, that it sways back and forth in. Then they went and took all the limbs off of it and just pulled the single stem and let it go back and forth. And what we see is that um, if you look at the time scale here, this is eight seconds. Uh, this is 15 seconds to the end there. So there's this huge increase in what we call decay time. And that's just the period of time that the piece goes back and forth. Um, and this increase in the frequency, so the speed at which it, it, it um, moves back and forth. Ken James uh, put together this model and, you know, again, it's 2006, but I, I really like this model because visually it, it helps us understand um, perhaps what's going on. You know, there's still more work that needs to be done and we're still working on this specific idea, but the idea that each individual limb operates on its own uh, frequency domain helps to basically self-cancel the system so that when we look at the tree blowing back and forth in the wind, it doesn't blow back and forth as a single movement. Each individual limb is working at a different, different frequency and with a different gust. 
And by the time it all works down to the end, a lot of the energy has been dissipated through a variety of damping methods, whether it's aerodynamic uh, or viscous damping within the wood. Um, basically, this, the tree works to reduce the amount of energy input into the ground and into the base of the tree. So the question was, does this map to rigging? We know that from a wind input, this works, um, but what happens in a rigging scenario? And what would happen if we, we uh, examine it in that point? The theory suggests for sure that the, the, the frequency, the decay rate would change, but will it actually decrease the amount of stem strain? So that, that's the hypothesis. Does it, the question, does it um, reduce the amount of strain itself, the, the, the magnitude? So we went back to Windsor Park, same park. Uh, this time the ash tree is a little bit smaller. Um, we're about 30 centimeters uh, diameter. That's just around a foot, um, 14 meters tall. I can't remember how many feet that is, 60 feet, something like that. Um, has a total mass of 850 kilograms. I know that because we the whole thing up and weighed every individual piece and measured all kinds of lengths and diameters and this whole uh, suite of allometry data. Uh, we're going to systematically remove limbs. So we're going to start at the bottom. We're going to take the first limb off, drop a top, take the second limb off, drop a top, and work our way up. I would have loved to change this up and done one, four, three, two, two, four, three, you know, back and forth, but uh, we couldn't figure out how to attach the, the limbs back on. So uh, we just left it as this, and this is this is project one. Um, we removed all the interior limbs just to, to reduce their effect, um, so I didn't have to measure all of that. Uh, the whole tree, uh, tree was strung with uh, accelerometers, so basically each individual limb has an accelerometer, all triggered through a, uh, simultaneously through a wire loom. I'd love to go wireless, but the headaches are just enormous. Uh, I had to plug in my laptop this morning because of wireless issues. <laughs> Um, we've got an uh, accelerometer um, the top, and also, again, an accelerometer in the base uh, or in the log that's, that's going to fall. Um, we decided not to use the bushy top um, because I was afraid that, that any aerodynamic, any change in wind would really change uh, the loading that the piece had. And if we could reduce that variance by just using a, a basic log, a, a weight uh, that was close, we figured in mass, or at least in, in loading, uh, that would that would kind of reduce that variance. Uh, same setup, we've got our strain gauges at the base of the tree uh, for the riggers in the in the crowd. Yes, this got moved down. That was the original installation. Like, no, 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 we got it. We tightened that up. Let's move down. Uh, we've got our strain gauges um, and a load cell uh, right there at the portal wrap. Um, so this is the tree ready to start the experiment with our, our six limbs. Um, this time to control the direction of the piece, uh, we had this piece chucker that aligned the piece and then it, it sent it out um, in the same direction. And basically you just hold the piece, let it go and it would fall. So there's no input of energy from the operator up above um, to, to change any variation. And here we are. Working the tree back together once again. So after every scenario, we would um, bring the piece back up and, and, and drop it three times uh, and then take the next limb off three times uh, and so forth. There was um, one minor incident. Um, always check your rigging, always check sling attachments. So we have, uh, slow-mo is so cool. We have our piece um, ready to go here. You'll see it start to move in a second, rope down. Piece comes off, everything's looking good. Rope's gonna go slack for a second as it comes into the system. Rope should go tight. Piece should start to slow down. There's the sling that's supposed to be attached to the sled. There's the piece hitting the ground. Okay, that's not too bad. Oh, it's gonna hit the safety umbrella. And that's my computer flying across the yard. Um, luckily, the, the data or the day was saved. It just smashed the screen. It was a bit of a wake up call on the setup. Um, I found a screen and we kept on going. <laughs> um, here's just the basic excerpt of the allometry data at the top. 
Uh, the original top had a mass of 108 kilograms. That's the bushy top with all the leaves on. Um, the piece that we used repeatedly over again was about half that, 50 kilograms. Pay attention to the last limb. It weighed a mere 18 kilograms. Its total mass was only 2% of the tree's total mass. Um, tiny little piece. Uh, I think it was this one here. Can't remember this one or this one. One of the two. Um, so our original top, uh, because it's leafy and heavy, it's falling with a fair amount of mass, but it's falling slow. And so it imparts, you know, strain over a fairly long period of time, pulling on the stem. Our 50 kilogram piece, it's falling fast. It's only 50 kilograms, but it's falling a lot faster. And its impact is much shorter. But the strain that it imparts is almost 50% more than our, um, our original top. So interesting that almost 50% more, yet the porter wrap load is not that much more. And I think that's because there's a whole lot of uptake and elongation in the, in, the, uh, in the fall of the rope. So just you know, pointing more, little other bits of data that are coming out of this project that are pointing to some of the issues that we need to look at and understand a little bit more th thoroughly. Um, so here's just a sample. Again, there's, you know, there's repetitions of that and there's more limbs inside of here, but uh, our full tree, an example of our full tree load with about 1.6 uh, uh, or 0.06. And each time the load, that the, the strain that the stem is seen is going up and up. But not only that, what's happening afterwards is changing. And here we see our last one, uh, this sort of max strain here, and then this really long uh, decay time. Okay, this was totally expected. This was the unknown question. Was this going to change a lot? Uh, from our sample, most of our Porter Wrap um, data is similar, which means that you know generally the project's fairly robust. The results. <laughs> okay, um, two stems. Two small stems left at the top of the tree reduced the amount of strain the stem saw by 35%. That's more than using a ring and working it well. Even just a single stem in this scenario, in this particular scenario, uh, reduced the amount of strain by 20%. Again, significant amount of strain. I think this really point, this for climbers who have been doing this or preaching this for the last couple of years, um, this is like, yeah, we, we we know what we're talking about up there. We know this is happening. Uh, this is the this is the data to back it up. And this is the pointed out to other climbers that are have yet to sort of think about this in their in their daily daily workflow um, to incorporate how they're taking things down to really help mitigate some of this strain. Um, just another little side bit that came out of here. So we have, this is the increased strain over time. And I just ran the analysis on the Porter Wrap load and it went the other way. And I got really confused. I was like, what have I done wrong? And why is that happening? And then I thought, no, no, listen, Matt, that's perfectly perfect. <laughs> As the strain is going up, we didn't see a big change in the Porter Wrap load because the strain is being put into the tree. So energy is energy. We can't kill it. It's still out there. And so, of course, we're putting energy in the tree. We're putting less energy into the rope. What does that mean? The ground operator is like, yeah, I got this. No problem. But the tree's like, I don't got this. <laughs> so it's just, you know, sort of putting all this stuff together to understand, yeah, it might be getting better on the ground, but it's not getting any better for the tree. All right. Now where's my mouse? There it is. Um, so how do I make this work? And, and I, I got to clear the top. I understand you need a, you know, you need a, a, you need to rig and manage and and put things in in small target zones. This is really important up at the top. That's what it really comes down to. And these are some pictures sent, not me working, but a, a friend who's like, he's like Matt. Here, maybe you can use these. This is a, a scenario uh, went through. We're in. We're just kind of coming out of peak ash. 
from Emerald Ashbore in Montreal. Uh, they weren't climbing stuff anymore. Everything's being accessed by spider lifts in the backyard. He's like, I'm still using your damping theory because I, he's like, I just don't want the tree to break apart underneath us and, and have an accident. And he's like, it, it works so well. So this is his, his rig scenario. He's got his, uh, he's using a, a ring. The first piece he's going to take off is this one. Then he's going to take off this one. The, th the third brushy piece is not a negative rig. It's below the rigging point. The whole center of mass is below. So he gets rid of these big negative rigs ahead of time. And now the piece, the, the next piece is a non-negative rig load. Then he's going to work his way down the stem. He's got two more branches down here that he's left. He's still in good position to rig these out and get them out of the ground. But then he's into big wood and, and everything gets calmer and and generally better and easier uh, once you're down into the bigger wood, um, particularly in brittle stuff. So, you know, there, there are ways to figure it out. It just takes a little bit of change and practice um, and, and everything works well. And I'm starting to run out of time. So I'm gonna move a little bit quicker here. I have a whole nother project, talking too slow. Um, this mass times distance stuff, um, we have, uh, the idea is that the, the, the mass is not as important as the height the mass falls from. So, I mean, mass is still important, but what's as important, or if not more important, is, is the mass that it falls from. So if I'm in bigger wood and I've got a 100 kilogram, 200 pound piece, um, and it's gonna fall about a half, or it's about a half meter from the, from the, um, from the anchor point, it's gonna fall about a meter, right? Because center point's gonna drop off here, it's gonna get captured down here. That's about 500 joules. The same mass in a narrow, skinny little piece way up at the top of the tree, well, it's it's a lot taller for that same mass. Even though the ground person's like, I got it, no problem. It's going to impart two times the amount of energy uh, into the stem because it has to fall two times the distance. And so, again, it's going to get amplified by the lever arm of the of the tree. So the higher up the tree we are, the more rotational force, any the higher the bending moment is. So if I've got, and we can use from you know sort of our our acquired data from before, looking at sort of average loads, we know that sort of a, the top that weighs about three hundred pounds or one hundred and fifty kilograms. Uh, when it falls, it's going to put about not have about 950 joules of 9,500 joules of energy. And we get a load of somewhere around 450 kilograms at the Porter Rath. Well, that equates to a bending moment. How much this stem is being bent? About 1,500 Newton or 15,000 Newton meters. The next piece down, because I'm going lower down the tree, we're down to 550 joules because it's shorter for the same amount of mass. A little bit less, you know, not a whole lot less energy in the porter app, but because we're shorter down the stem, we have this huge reduction in the bending moment, somewhere around 840 Newton meters. Again, this is some back of the napkin math, like, you know, not every scenario, just conceptually what you have to think about um, when you're working up at the top of the tree. And that's where all of this stuff is really important. Um, we did this project again. We got the same results. That's all that. Okay. I'm really running out of time because this is a big one. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to rush through some of the background on this or some of this just so we can get to the important bits. Um, I'll still try and run the story, but um, we're going to look at uh, a bunch of people were helped out. Oops. Yeah, a whole bunch of people helped out. I really need to thank them all. Um, this was kind of an semi-unfunded project. So there was a lot of volunteer support. We're looking at getting some more funding um, to, to move this the next step down the road. Uh, City of North Van, UBC, uh, my supervisor kicked in some money. Bartlett Tree Experts provided a whole bunch of equipment and and um, and help. And um, Simply Trees out of Toronto came out and helped out. So anyways, this is single stem focus. So we're moving away from biomechanics. Uh, this is really just energy input um, in a single stem scenario. Uh, we're going to look at Western Hemlock um, in part because uh, it's dying on the uh, West Coast in, in at stand level decline. Um, basically, the drought and uh, Western looper moth um, is 
basically wiping out this 150-year-old uh, stand uh, in around the Vancouver area, um, stand level decline, a lot of stuff dying. A lot of it is in the urban setting, uh, and they're big and tall, and they have to be managed uh, somehow, and that's often with climbers. Um, there's not a lot of research, uh, and there's not any research on the effect of notch angle on the load that goes into the stem. We have one kind of sideline of some work that from Andreas Detter back in, in 2018 or uh, 2008. Um, so basically we're gonna examine the force uh, from non-rig removals of uh, tops with different, um, different notch configurations. Uh, similar setup, we've got some, some, more, some more sensors in a few different places. Uh, we're going to pluck test and somebody pulling on a five to one uh, at the end to, to calibrate the trees. These are the three notches we're going to look at. Uh, bird's mouth, humble, and an open face. Uh, this is the site. It's in Vancouver. Uh, we prepped some stuff ahead. <laughs> I'm going to go really fast here. I'm sorry. Um, it was super challenging terrain. Showed up. Um, I was working in Montreal. Um, and, and Ryan uh, on the ground out in in Vancouver found the site, uh, showed up, had to like buy more wire and come up with ways to work on a super steep slope. Uh, slopes never never look as bad as they are in cameras, but this was like sliding down the hill. Important to this is that we we do this pluck test. Oops. Um, oh come on, no. Uh, a tree um, ahead of time to calibrate all the sensors. So that's how we did this. One. So we we put a big, uh, not a big force, we put um, Nick on the five to one at the base, generate around 250 kilograms of load into the tree, let it sway back and forth, throw the top, do that again. Um, basically, you'd see Every time he pulls on the rope, we'd see some strain in the rope, things that equalize. We let it go. The tree would do its thing. Uh, we linear regress that. We get a nice um, equation. And then from there, we can take all the inputs from the pieces and, and come up with some numbers. We threw a whole lot of tops. We have 26 um, in total that worked. We threw a little over 30. Had to throw some out. Uh, we, we got some wood mass. Um, this is some data. I'm talking really fast. <laughs> uh, we did really well generally on our consistencies. Um, so we measured, you know, the notch angles, uh, width of the hinge, um, depth of the back cut, that sort of thing. Um, these are probably my cuts. Ryan did most of it, and he was getting tired, and I had to go up and do some extra. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm not as good. Anyway, um, so those are my outliers. Um, the trees were really stable. We had a spatial sensor at the base that made sure that the root plate wasn't moving. It was just the upper part of the tree. Uh, if the root plate moved, we'd have to throw out the data. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about strain in one direction. We can put them together. We get them in two directions, and we get this cool map of how the tree moves in space uh, from the base. Uh, the trees behaved differently. That's what that graph says. <laughs> Talking really fast. Okay. Um, I... Uh, this is my first graph. I ran this and threw my hands up and went, oh my goodness, uh, we've done nothing. There's absolutely no relationship there. Oh, this whole project. And then I was like, wait a second, Matt. I took the tops out. Uh, they were really light. Things started to happen, refine things a bit more. Things were getting better um, just by, the, by the, the type of section and then the section length, then a little bit more refinement on controlling for vi variance. And here we go. Yeah. Um, the pushback, the initial pushback that the stem sees from uh, the three different notches isn't that varied, but the amount that the tree moves forward is huge. Um, and this point I should throw out, I think it's in the next, oh, no, uh, I thought I had a slide with, with this removed. When we remove this one outlier, it gets way better. Um, I've left it in because... You know, it was what it was. I'm not sure what happened in that scenario, why it was so much higher than everything else. 
Um, but anyway, that's that. Um, so sorry, that was really fast. But basically, um, the cool thing that came out of it is we know there is this initial pushback. That's the first thing that happens in a non-rig scenario. So, um, you know, the tree's moving around. The first thing is it goes backwards uh, and then it goes forwards. Um, backwards, backwards, and then it gets pulled in the other direction. Um, so the pushback is a real thing. Um, the notch angle appears to have a significant effect on the forward pull. Um, maybe not so much as the pushback. Um, the more open the notch tends to impart a larger bending moment on the stem. Um, but again, these are only applicable to non-rig scenarios. We need more data. We need to go and do this project again. Um, the, the big take home, I think, away from this whole thing was that we could use the results from it to do some really basic modeling. If I throw a five meter top up near the top of the tree, I would get somewhere around 25 kilograms, 50 pounds of back force, somewhere around 50 kilograms, 100 pounds of forward force. That's a rotational torque of somewhere around 1,100 foot pounds. It's a few uga ugas on the impact gun at the base, not a lot. If I go down, and this we did not, I just we did not throw pieces this big. But we can model from what we, the different sizes that we had, um, an approximation. If I go down to and throw a 15 meter top, somewhere around the halfway point, that imparts about 80 kilograms of back force, not a lot, 285 kilograms of forward force. That's a rotational torque at that height down at the base of around 4,200 foot pounds, 5,700 Newton meters. That's a fair amount of force on these stems. Um, so I think there's kind of this sweet spot, or not sweet spot, the danger zone around the halfway point that comes out from this little bit of modeling that, you know, once we get below that, there's not such an effect because the lever A uh, length is reduced. But, you know, throwing really big tops in around here is sketchy business. Okay, there we go. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All kinds of people helped out on this, all these projects. Uh, huge shout out to the Tree Fund, of course, for starting it all off. And then anybody else that, that came along as well. And there we go. I was supposed to have 10 minutes for questions, but um, we're a little short. Matt, thank you very much. Fantastic uh, presentation. Tons and tons of data out there. I did see a few questions. We'll get to some of those, but I just wanted to remind everybody of a couple key points. This is being recorded and you will be able to rewatch it. If you kind of wanted to look at it again, it'll be uh, uploaded on the treefund.org under the webinars tab. So you'll be able to find this there. Um, and just a reminder on CEUs, the way we do CEUs, when you registered, um, you put in your certification number, we capture your name when you joined the webinar that we asked that you stay on for the majority of the time. So if you were on three quarters of the time, we will automatically send your information directly to uh, ISA. So there's nothing you need to do on that front. Just a, a couple of reminders. I know people joined this a few minutes late uh, and probably missed that. Matt, let's jump into just a few questions. Um, the first one that came up is, and I think this was early on in your presentation, somebody asked what type of rigging lines uh, were used during this test? So... Uh in in both, I use stable braid, uh, and I'm I'm not a rope person. I mean, I'm a gearhead, but ropes rope as far as I'm concerned. I know that's very bad. A static rope, uh, a dynamic rope. Um, I like stable braid. Um, in this scenario, it's pretty consistent. Um, there's not a whole lot of stretch. Uh, we were using the same rope every time, and I wanted something that had limited variance. Uh, I'm sorry, the stable braid. Um. Oh, I can't remember what size it was. I can go back, but yeah. Thank you. And I'm jumping around to the questions here. Uh, so I apologize that we're not going to get to all of them today. But um, uh, Elliot asked us, what were your personal opinions and what do you recommend for better safe rigging systems, rings or blocks? So rings work. They work when the piece is allowed to run. But again, Brian's paper showed it clearly that in a snubbed off scenario, 
they are more problematic in some cases because they don't allow for the stretch, the same amount of stretch in the in the rope leading down to the friction device. So when everything works great, they work great. Um, but you have that uh, if if the person on the ground um, is newer, <laughs> um, it's probably better to work with something uh, like a like a block. And again, you know, it's really specific. Are really site specific, but um, I like rings for negative rakes for sure. Anytime a winch is getting used, I'm using a block. And I'll, I'll ask one more question, and I apologize for those who don't get to everybody's questions, but um, uh, Gordon asked um, this height reduction, I think this was towards the end of your presentation, uh, lowering the forces on the tree supports our mitigation options to reduce the risk of a whole tree failure by reducing height and spread. He asks, is this usable based on, on your studies? So, I mean, my other line of research is, is really looking at pruning effects. And, and yes, 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 generally speaking, you reduce the length, you reduce the lever. There's a whole suite of issues of how the tree responds and it's species specific. Um, from the mechanics point of view, reducing the lever reduces the load um, seen further down. Um, but you know that it's a it's a it's an open field. Um, I I don't know if you want. I'm happy to stay for a little bit longer if people need to go and you want to answer some more questions. I could also throw an email out there if you want. Yeah, I'll tell you what. We'll do one more question. Um, and I I do have another meeting I need to jump off to. Gotcha. And so I'll, I'll throw one more question and we will, I think we'll send you those questions. And as you have time, if you want to respond and we can maybe upload those on the tree fund site under the webinar. Perfect. So I want to add more Perfect. work to you, Matt, but if, if you're willing, we can maybe do some of yeah. that and get a little bit of both. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'll just ask one more question. Um, John asks, this is I think towards the end of your presentation, thinking about chapter three, what notch would you recommend to reduce movement in the top of the tree. So, yeah, and sorry, it was so fast. I I, I, I wasn't watching the clock on the, on the earlier one. I should have sped things up there. Um, uh, so what we really saw there, that the birds move, the really open notch, you know, the big, wide open 90 degree notch, that allows the piece to fall continuously, still attached. And when it finally starts to tear at the hinge, uh, it has converted more of its potential energy into kinetic energy, and it pulls the stem more. So the from this initial project, where the sample size is not as big as we'd hope, we, we see that the more open the notch, the more forward bending moment is put per, per piece. Um, so ideally, you know, the sm the smaller the notch, the less input of energy from the falling piece. Now, what happens to it from a trajectory point? We haven't figured that out yet, and that's the next step. We're gonna put we're gonna put spatials in the piece as it falls and track its direction, and um, but uh, hopefully that gets funded, and and then we're then we're off to the races on that one. Uh, but yeah, big open notch <laughs> thing falls a long way, imparts a lot more more strain. That's the fun part about research, right? You, you start to answer one question and you end up uh, with a lot of new questions yeah. that arise from the research um, that need future research. And I think it's one of the big things that we learned because, you know, the open face notch is kind of that industry standard for more control, but, you know, you're pointing to some possible problems with that. Matt, with that, I, I will bring us to a close today. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us on the Tree Fund webinar series. It's a pleasure to have you. It's wonderful to see these kind of safe arborist technique projects. I saw somebody comment they were a few minutes late because they were actually blocking down a tree. So it, it's great to see everybody on here. We had people from all over the world. Thanks to all who attended. Thank you for your time. Thanks to Paul Putman um, and Heath Hoopke who make this webinar series. I'm the host, I'm the moderator, but they really do a lot of the background work with this webinar series. The thanks to everybody. We will be back. We're hoping for another webinar in May. Uh, Heath is working on that topic. Um, keep an eye on that tree fund page to take a look at that. Matt, once again, thank you for your time today and hope to see everybody back in May. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Cheers.